expect from me in the next couple of uh, days. I'm going to explain what is going to be happening with the last three weeks of the semester. We're going to go asynchronous just because I know that some of you are going to be going home. You might be going to a different time zone or a different place where your internet capability may be a little bit different. So how I tend to do this, I teach asynchronously. So I will basically dump a bunch of videos on the Monday each week and you'll have the entire week to watch them at your own pace. So you'll get about three videos from me that would kind of correspond to a lecture on Monday or Wednesday or Friday, but you can do them at your pace. And office hours will be on Zoom. And because I will be at home, you might get to see my dog or my cat, which is always nice. All right, so the last time that we were here, we were talking about different types of theories of emotion. So we talked about the James Lang theory, which is basically the idea that when uh, when you are experiencing an emotion, that emotion has been caused by physiological arousal. So physiological arousal always comes before your emotional experience. Then we talked about the Cannon Bard theory, which is basically the idea that these, that our arousal, our states of arousal, the body's responses are too similar to each other across a variety of emotions. So I tend to have a pounding heart when I'm surprised, when I'm scared, when I'm happy, when I'm angry. So how on earth do I tell them apart? Cannon and Bard believe that they occur simultaneously and they're separate from each other. They do not cause each other. And then finally, we finished with the Schachter Singer two-factor theory, which basically says that arousal does cause emotion, but because body, body responses are so similar to each other, we also require a cognitive label of sorts. So we experience a pounding heart and we label that as fear and both of those together cause the emotion of fear. So what evidence do we actually have for the two factor theory? Um, so this is a really interesting study. A group of men were given either epinephrine or they were given a placebo. So really quick, epinephrine is the primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system. It's basically adrenaline. So if I give you a shot of adrenaline, what kind of things do you think you might experience? What's gonna happen if I give you a shot of adrenaline? Anybody? So this is gonna kick off the fight or flight response. So that'll include things like, oh, let's see, maybe somebody's gonna beat me to the punch. Increased heart rate, very good. It's also going to increase respiration. It's going to inhibit digestion. And that's going to look, and, and, and that's basically going to look like bodily arousal. So if I give you a shot of epinephrine, that's going to enhance your body's arousal. So here's what's really interesting. The epinephrine group, the group of men that got this adrenaline, we're either told, hey, um, we're going to give you a shot of something and it's going to increase your heart rate and it's going to increase your respiration. Don't worry about it. That's part of how this works. Another group was misinformed about the effects of this. So they were told, hey, um, we're going to inject you with this drug, but it's not supposed to do anything and you're not supposed to feel any bodily effects. So for the group that gets adrenaline, or epinephrine, and they start feeling those bodily effects, they can explain it away, right? They've been told this is what's going to happen. Now, on the other hand, the group that's been misinformed, they're feeling these bodily responses, but they've been told that they shouldn't. 
So they can't necessarily attribute that to the drug because they've basically been told that the drug does nothing. So here's what's really interesting. This group, this misinformed, all of the men were asked to wait with somebody that we call a confederate. Now, I don't know if we have used this term in class before. A confederate is somebody who is basically an actor. They are working with the experimenter um, and they are basically there to help the experimenter. So a confederate is somebody who's basically in cahoots uh, with the experimenter. And so this confederate was either acting angry or the confederate was acting happy. So they were either in a happy mood or they were in an angry mood. And what's interesting is that the group that was misinformed, they're feeling this bodily arousal due to the epinephrine, but they've been told that they shouldn't feel anything. Once you sit them with somebody who is angry or happy, um, their emotions end up matching the Confederate's emotional state. So one of the other ways that we can kind of see this, a label is everything. So it's part of the reason why, how many of you have heard of the idea that if you like somebody, um, that if somebody likes, if you want somebody to like you, that you should take them to a haunted house or take them to a scary movie or things or take them on a roller coaster? I don't know if any of you have heard that or not, but it's kind of based on the Schachter Singer 2 factor theory. So the idea here being that you get scared when you're watching the movie. And because the cognitive label is everything, you're there, you could either choose to label it as, oh, I'm feeling this way because I'm watching a scary movie, or you could choose to label it as, I'm feeling this way because I think I like the person that I'm sitting next to. So you could potentially mislabel the, um, what you're feeling as being due to liking somebody. So if you really want somebody to like you, get them to do something that gets their heart rate up. So they'll think it's because they like you and maybe they will end up liking you. Uh, there's a really famous study of this where researchers basically had men walk across like a really creepy looking suspension bridge across like a canyon. And that's really scary, right? So they have a, a, a very attractive lab assistant waiting on the other end. And um, the lab assistant basically goes, hey, um, if you have any questions about anything that took place, here's the number, here's, here's a number, give me a call. Uh, and it turns out that the group of men that were walking across that suspension bridge, as opposed to men who were walking across a very, very safe concrete bridge, not scary at all, the men who were scared were more likely to ask for her number. They had all of this um, fear and this arousal and it spilled over into meeting this woman, finding her attractive and basically saying, well, I'm feeling this way, not because I'm scared, but because I must be attracted to her. So we can find this in a lot of different ways. So I'll talk a little bit more about this spillover in a little bit. So let's talk very briefly about the connection between how we think and how we end up feeling. Can you actually change your emotions by changing your thinking? And I know for me, that's something that I think on some level you can do. I don't think you can necessarily do it 100% of the time, but I know that if I'm feeling anxious about something, I try to channel that energy into, um, I try to channel that energy into doing a good job on whatever it is I'm doing or getting excited about something like a play that I'm in or uh, different things like that. Everybody good? Okay. 
So I, I've kind of mentioned this before, but we have what is referred to as cognitive spillover. And cognitive spillover is basically the idea that sometimes your bodily arousal takes a while to dissipate. So I know for me, if I'm kind of in a very tense or agitated emotional state, it can take a while for me to calm down. The same is potentially true for you. And so what we actually end up finding is that oftentimes, if you are highly aroused because of something, what we tend to find is that that response tends to spill over into our response to the next event. So one of the ways that you can kind of see this um, is when people start rioting after sporting events. So oftentimes this kind of rioting will happen. Um, I'm a hockey fan. So the last big time that I heard about this was um, when the Vancouver Canucks uh, ended up losing a very high stakes game. I believe it was a Stanley Cup final. If it wasn't a Stanley Cup final, it was definitely a championship. Like it was in the playoffs. So you have this really high stakes event. People are really tense and then a team loses. And that team, the fans of that team are really angry. They're feeling a lot of arousal. They've been sitting here in this tense, tense game and they could take their frustration out on the game, like lots of yelling and screaming and cheering, but now the game's over and they lost. So you have all of this pent up arousal and where, what are you gonna do with it? So we see this manifest in a lot of different ways. In the case of Vancouver fans, they kind of ended up tearing things up around the city and lighting things on fire. Uh, in the case of a high stakes college football game, I've seen fans run down and tear down a goalpost. So often what will happen is that when we are in that highly uh, high state of physiological arousal, it's not necessarily going to very neatly go away just because the event's over. It's going to spill over into the next event that you encounter. So if you had a bad day at work, you're probably very, very likely to take that arousal home with you and potentially take it out on somebody else. Um, so here's another example. Um, so we have high arousal from a soccer match that can make people really angry. It can lead to rioting. In certain cases, wars between countries have ended up happening because of very tense, high stakes soccer matches. So let's talk a little bit more about the relationship between emotion and thought. So we're gonna talk about two different routes to emotion. And the first route that we are gonna talk about comes from Zions. And yes, that is in fact how you pronounce his name, Zions and uh, Joseph Ledoux. Now, there are some emotional responses that you have that are immediate and you don't even have to think about them. And by and large, that will be areas like the amygdala, areas in the limbic system in the brain that are going to do this immediate emotional exposure without having to think too hard about it. Now, on the other hand, for other types of emotions, researchers, uh, including Lazarus, as well as Schachter and Singer, who developed the two-factor theory, say that the way that you think about things also determines the emotion you feel. So we've, we've basically got two different ways that we can reach an emotion. We have what is referred to as the low road to emotion, so we have an event that immediately provokes an emotional response. And then we have what we call the high road of emotion or the high road, because the high road uh, involves use of the cortex, the cerebral cortex. You actively have to think about how you feel about something. Um, so here, the high road is basically we have an event, 
we go to the cortex, we give it some type of appraisal, we actually think about how we're feeling, and then that leads to an emotional response. So the high road first travels to the cortex and then to the amygdala. And we tend to find that this largely exists for complex emotions. So for example, uh, last year, my grandmother passed away. Um, she had been fighting Alzheimer's disease for about 15 years, if not a little bit longer. And so that was a very, very complicated sort of thing because by the time, uh, even about 10 years ago, she already didn't remember me. She didn't remember a lot of people in her life. And so we had lost the person that she was much, much sooner than the day that she died. And so it was a very, very complicated situation where we felt a, most of us felt a mix of sadness that she was gone and that we would never get her back certainly not the way she was, um, but also a sense of relief because it can be very, very hard to lose your memory like that. And she must have been very, very scared at times. So it's a very complicated situation where we missed her, we, we loved her and we missed her and we were grieving for her, but we were also relieved that her suffering was over. And that is a very complicated thing to feel. So in this case, that would probably take the high road. Now, on the other hand, we have the low road. That bypasses the cortex and goes straight to the amygdala. If the snake ends up in this room, I am going to freak out and go, ew, no, get it away from me. Um, that is not something that I have to think about very hard. I don't like snakes. Now, on the other hand, is there something that you absolutely love that you don't have to think too hard about? Like it pops up and you go, oh, this is so great. Anybody? My cat. Your cat? Yeah. So in that case, that would probably take the low road of emotion. It's for a very simple like or dislike. So I like this. I don't have to think too hard about it. I love it. I don't have to think too hard about it. I don't love it. Um, or a fear. Dogs. I love corgis. And she said it in all caps, which really lets you know that she meant it. <laughs> I like all dogs. All dogs are good boys, or at least start as good boys. And, and, and yes, you can be a good boy even if you are a girl dog. <laughs> okay. So now we're gonna talk about expressed emotion. And we kind of demonstrated some of this uh, last time. I gotta say, one of the downsides of wearing masks is that really, like, y'all have no idea how expressive my face is until you see me on Zoom or in video because the mask basically covers the bottom half of my face. And unfortunately, my eyes and eyebrows can really only do so much. And I think that's been one of the things that I've really been struggling with as much as I think masks are helpful. Y'all can't see me smile. You probably have a pretty good idea when I'm smiling. I get little crinkles, um, but we're missing out on some of that expressed emotional experience. So we already had some brave people act this out. And believe me, if we were not in a pandemic, I would make you come up in front of the class and do it. Here, like, I'm actually grateful for the pandemic, Dr. Gilchrist. Please don't bring me up in front of everybody. Um, so emotions are expressed by our face, by our body, and by the intonation of our voice. Your whole body tells you um, how your whole body tells other people how you are feeling. So in case you haven't noticed, Dr. Gilchrist gets very excited talking about psychology, even though you're only really getting her from the neck up. If you're zooming in, you can see my arms move. You can see my hands move. I'm very, very emphatic. Uh, apparently I sometimes like to do a karate chop when I'm saying this is important. Um, but there are other ways that we can express our emotions as well. So of course we have our face, 
but we also have our voice. So notice that as I'm talking, there's a very natural rising and falling uh, pattern in the tones of my voice. Now I want you to imagine if I came in one day and I sounded like this. Hey everybody, um, I'm having a really hard day today and um, we're, we're gonna talk about psychology. So you can kind of see that there's less of that rising falling pattern. Most of you would probably get the idea that something is not right. And so we express our emotions to each other in a variety of different ways. But we also get a lot of nonverbal cues. Uh, we have things like body language. We have things like eye contact or gaze. We also have things like physical touch. So how many of you have ever been like somebody who's making like, uh, to borrow a phrase from a Bur Bo Burnham comedy special, prolonged eye contact. Now, for some of you, that long eye contact, that held gaze might be a little too much because oftentimes we tend to only really make that kind of prolonged eye contact with somebody that we really, really like. Um, so one of the things that uh, researchers have actually found is that if you ask couples to really just hold their gaze with each other, they often will report feeling very, very close in their relationship. Um, eye contact, especially if it is prolonged and held, um, can actually be a sign that you feel very, very intimately about somebody. Um, please make sure you blink. Don't be a Hannibal Lecter and not blink your eyes. That's just creepy. Um, body language also plays a role. So I know you're not gonna be able to see this, but if I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, we can probably guess that something bad happened. If I'm like this, Maybe I'm a little closed off. Maybe I'm cold. Maybe I don't really want to talk to anybody. Maybe I feel like I need to hug myself. I'm feeling a little out of place. Um, physical touch can be another thing that can also show this. But um, you have to kind of be aware um, that certain nonverbal cues vary in meaning from one culture to the next. So going back to that video I showed you where a guy gives this symbol to symbolize what in our culture would be okay, but then says it stinks. In Spain, this may potentially mean zero. So he's actually going, it was terrible, thank you. And then doing a smile like, thanks, I hate it. Um, so that could be a case of cultural differences. Um, I'm trying to look up a few, but if you know any cultural differences in body language, feel free, or uh, nonverbal signals, feel free to share. In Austria, there's like tourism, but I feel like they don't know. Ooh. <laughs> I think in certain cultures, a thumbs up. Yeah. I, I think a thumbs up can be very inappropriate. Oh, here we go, I found a few. Uh, greetings with a handshake. How many of you think we're going to have a handshake after, after all of this is over? Now, other cultures do not do handshakes. Uh, in certain cultures, I, on, on the other hand, in certain cultures, I've gotten a handshake so hard that I felt like my hand was going to come off. Other cultures will bow. Uh, in terms of facial expressions, as we're going to find out very soon, there aren't really a lot of cultural differences in terms of facial expressions. But hand gestures can be help, uh, interesting. So um, the okay sign, which I just gave you, um, in Greece, Spain, or Brazil, it can also mean that you're calling somebody, um, for lack of a better term, um, a butthole. <laughs> That's the uh, PG term. Um, if you are a, a thumbs up, that kind of indicates in the United States and in the Western Hemisphere in Europe that you've done a good job. Uh, in Greece or the Middle East, this basically means up yours. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, if I do this, what am I telling you? Come closer, come here. 
Um, this is rude in areas like China, East Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines. Um, this could actually get you arrested in the Philippines. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Um, oh, interesting. On Inauguration Day in 2005, President George W. Bush raised his fist with the index and the little finger extended in the shape of the Texas Longhorn football team logo. Newspapers around the world expressed their astonishment at the use of a gesture. In many Mediterranean and Latin countries, such as Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, to make this sign is to tell at someone is to tell them that their spouse is cheating on them. So yeah, verbal, these nonverbal gestures and cues can actually vary in meaning from one culture to the next. Holding up a middle finger here in this culture is very, very bad. It'll really make people angry at you. Other cultures, it's a sign of good luck. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, what's actually kind of interesting is that in terms of detecting emotion, we have an easier time noticing a negative or angry face. And that face will tend to pop out much faster to us than a single happy face. So we're gonna try something. Uh, I'm gonna show you a bunch of faces if you are here in class, I want you to raise your hand as soon as you see the face that is different. Uh, if you are on Zoom or on Discord, I'd like you to just type in Y for yes, as soon as you see the face that is different. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Okay, did you get it? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna try the next one, are you ready? All right, here we go. Oh, wait, we got a few more people. Okay, good, good, good. All right, now we're gonna try the next one. Here we go. You won't let me. Okay, so here's my question. So I showed you those two. Now we're gonna go back and take a look at them really quick. Did you have an easier time Wait, ah. did you have an easier time with this where you have a happy face in neutral faces or when you had uh, an angry face a bunch around a bunch of neutral faces? Who had an easier time with the happy face? Who had an easier time with the angry face? Angry, angry, angry. Okay, most people here in class uh, had an easier time detecting the angry face. And it looks like all of you did too. Um, people hopping on the chat are telling me they had uh, an easier time noticing the angry face. So what's actually kind of interesting is that human beings have a negativity bias. Negative information sticks out a lot more than positive information does. And at least some of this is due to evolution. So, Natural selection is basically the idea that random mutations in traits that kept us alive and helped us to survive carried forward to future generations. So one of the things that's really important is remember that, um, and I kind of brought this up when we talked about our need to belong, if you, in our ancestral history, if you were not surrounded by a group of people, you were basically as good as dead. You needed other people around you to help you find food, um, reproduce, and uh, generally, if you ticked somebody off, if you made somebody in the group mad, they could kick you out, and that would surely lead to very bad things happening to you. So we are kind of primed to look at negativity in the people around us because it's kind of that holdover from our ancestral history where being able to notice negative emotions in people could help us try to fix things, help us repair relationships with people, and thus keep our place within the group. So it was really important to know that negative information. 
Now let's talk a little bit about gender. Now I am I I'm, I do realize that this data is utilizing a gender binary. This is old data, so do kind of bear that in mind. Um, so one of the things that we find is that there are some very interesting gender differences in terms of expressed emotion versus felt emotion. So a lot of this, I would argue, is being due to socialization. Women are often presumed to be nurturing by nature, and at least in our past, they often were the ones who were expected to nurture. And so because of that, and because women are often socialized to talk about feelings and detect feelings in others and manage the feelings of others, we do tend to find that compared to men, women are better at discerning nonverbal emotions. So it sometimes leads to some really interesting scenarios where uh, somebody uses a slightly different tone than you're expecting them to, and you pick apart that tone, you're like, oh, the way you said that, are you mad at me? <laughs> There's almost this noticing of very, very subtle differences. Now, what's interesting is that women do express more emotions than men. Now, let's be really clear. Now, those emotions that women are often allowed to express are gonna be different from men. Women are pretty much allowed, not so much allowed, you can express whatever emotions you want, but in our society, um, women are often more permitted to express emotions like sadness and fear. The one that, that people tend to have a problem with is anger. Now, what's interesting is that it's a little bit different for men. In society, anger is the one emotion that men are often allowed to express. Um, and some of the other emotions, less so. So women do express more emotions, but they, they, there's not really a lot of gender difference in terms of the reported emotions and the physiological responses that people feel. Men feel emotions, but they often don't have a very good language with which to express them. They have not been socialized. Many of them have not been socialized that way. And so they don't necessarily always know how to label them in a way that a woman might. Um, so here you are looking at sad, happy, and scary films that groups of men and women had to watch. Now what's interesting, we have the number of facial expressions. Notice that across the board, women make more emotional expressions than men do. Um, but notice that men tend to express their emotions more when the film is happy. Not so much when it's sad or scary. Now, despite all of that, men do report feeling these emotions and they also have physiological responses that indicate that they are feeling these emotions. They just don't know how to talk about them. So now we're gonna talk about culture and emotional expression. Now across cultures, one of the things that's kind of interesting, the research from Paul Ekman actually suggests that there are six basic emotions that are expressed across cultures. So I mentioned that giving a thumbs up might not be the right thing to do if you're in the Middle East, but if I see somebody who's happy in the Middle East, that looks the same as somebody who is happy in China, somebody who is happy in, um, in Latin America, somebody who is happy in Europe, we all categorize basic emotions in similar ways. So here are our six basic emotions. So here we have happiness and the clear signal that we have the happiness, we have the crinkles in the eyes and uh, we have a genuine smile which shows the teeth. Um, here we have a look of surprise. We have wide eyes where we can see the whites. We have an open mouth and we have very open eyebrows. Here we have fear, which looks very similar to surprise, but notice that the eyebrows do something a little bit different. They kind of move in towards each other rather than being open, and the mouth is not wide open. Here we have sadness, 
Here we have anger and here we have disgust. Those are the six basic emotions. Now I know you're probably asking yourself, Dr. Gilchrist, why were there only five emotions in Inside Out? Well, the research, well, the people who made the movie thought that fear and surprise were too similar to each other. So they basically lumped fear and surprise together into one character. But all of the rest of the major emotions here are expressed. Now, I also know what you might be thinking. What about other cultures that don't have TV or movie exposure? Most of us learn about what happiness is by watching other people around us or watching TV. But it turns out that you still categorize these emotions the same way. This is something that is innate. This is not something that is due to movies or TV or socialization. And a lot of these have an evolutionary basis. And this comes from Darwin's theory. So really quick, um, I'm gonna focus on the face of disgust because it's my favorite one. Um, so disgust has a very familiar kind of telltale sign of the crinkling of the nose. Now, when would you be most likely to make a face of disgust? When would you be most likely to make a face like that? Well, that person kind of looks downright contemptuous, but if I'm like, ugh. When would I make a face like that? Oh, we got something in the chat. Let's see. Bad smell of food. Exactly. So you're probably going to make this face when you smell something bad or you see some bad meat. You're like, oh, oh, that's bad. You can even see I'm kind of doing it right now myself. I'm like, Ugh. Um, now, if you want, go ahead and make a disgust face right now. Notice what happens to your nose when you do. If you need to mimic smelling bad food, that helps too. Like, ugh. <laughs> now what you'll kind of notice is that that nose crinkle, Darwin believed that that had an evolutionary purpose. The idea being that when you crinkle your nose like that, you are basically closing off your nasal passages or at least attempting to. Um, and one of the other things you'll notice with disgust is you bring the lips really close to your nose like, ew. Um, and the idea behind doing that is that you want to get, you want to make sure you close off your nose and your mouth from breathing in those harmful particles, because usually food goes bad because of things like bacteria um, and uh, other things. And so that could have kept us alive. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now I'm going to skip this because the facial feedback effect, we are starting to find that it's no longer a thing. So oftentimes uh, it was previously reported that if you smiled, it made you feel happier. We are learning more and more that this is something that does not replicate very well. So I'm going to skip it. So we're going to finish up by talking about two different common emotions that we tend to experience. We're going to talk about anger and we're going to talk about happiness. Okay, so when people are asked about what makes them angry, the thing, now let's be clear, there are a lot of things that make a lot of people angry. And if you're in the, if you're the Incredible Hulk, well, you're always angry. But uh, for most of us, when we are asked about what kind of things make us angriest, we tend to find that the thing that makes us the angriest are when friends and loved ones commit wrongdoings, particularly if they are willful, that means that they chose to do what they did, unjustified, they had no good reason to do what they did, and avoidable, they could have chosen differently. Those are the things that tend to make the average person angriest. Like if a stranger cuts me off in traffic or gets too close to me in line or things like that, that makes me angry a little bit. 
but not the way that somebody who you care about and somebody who purports to care about you, like if somebody does that, that's going to be far more anger inducing and far more painful. So here's what's kind of interesting. It was thought for a while that venting anger was really, really good for you. That anger was not something that you should hold in and bury. And I'm kind of a believer in that, at least part of the way. I've had, um, I think the term I'd like to use is a uh, laser guide. I've seen uh, laser guided rage explosions in uh, various situations where people buried their anger and their frustration under a big, big pile of resentment. And generally at some point, if that resentment builds up, it will explode. But there was this idea that venting would help you feel better and would fix your problem. So if y'all were acting up or if y'all were cheating on tests and I came in, I'm like, y'all made me so angry. I can't believe you did that. That is so disrespectful. The idea being that me yelling like that would supposedly make me feel better. How many of you have been told to hit pillows? because it'll make you feel better. I used to go to kickboxing, hit a punching bag. It, it helps, or at least I thought it helped. What we actually tend to find is that is not true. We should not be like Emperor Palpatine and go release your anger, let the hate flow through you. Um, Nevada needs a rage room. <laughs> um, yeah, they have one in Springfield. Um, so there's this idea that venting our anger will provide us emotional release. And this is what's referred to as the catharsis hypothesis. But typically, venting our anger and unloading on the person that made us angry doesn't help. Oftentimes, what I have found is that venting my anger, and research has found this as well, venting my anger magnifies it. I generally do not feel better about a situation or a person after I have un emotionally unloaded on them like that. Additionally, behaving aggressively makes you more likely to be aggressive in the future. They have hammer throwing in Vegas. <laughs> well, I am Scottish. I come from the land of caber tossing. I could, I could throw a big tree. <laughs> Um, but here's probably the most important part. This is reinforcing. So imagine that I come in one day and I yell at you and I'm just like, you make me so mad. And you all start behaving. Hey, guess what? I've just learned that if I yell at you, I get what I want. That's reinforcement. And that means I'm going to be more likely to resort to that in the future because of that which is why I'm not really, when it comes to students, I'm not really the angry type. I tend to make a face and I go, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> I think that speaks a lot more than venting your anger. Venting does not prevent explosion. I mean, in certain cases it can, but oftentimes venting creates more explosions. So something to kind of keep in mind. Now let's talk about things that make us happy. Why on earth should we focus on happiness? Well, I would argue probably now more than ever, we need some happiness and joy in our lives. And I know that some people would argue that this is not the time to focus on joy, but honestly, we need a little bit of hope and we need a little bit of joy to be able to get through dark times. And even in the darkest of times, we should be able to find joy where we can. That's not minimizing. That's not me trying to minimize the bad things that people are going through, but rather it, it's not good for you or for me or for anybody to only focus on the bad. But here's what we know. Research shows that happy people tend to perceive the world as being safer. They have an easier time making decisions they are more ready to cooperate with others. They tend to be healthier. They tend to be more energized and they tend to have what they believe to be a very satisfying life. 
Research shows that they're more likely to be married and to make more money. And hey folks, remember correlation does not equal causation. It is possible that happier people are more likely to get married, but maybe married people just are happier or maybe there is a third variable. You can be happy without being married. Additionally, the, the correlation between happiness and money, same sort of thing. Maybe having more money makes you happier or maybe happy people just get more money. Um, so there could be some other variables there. So take it with a huge grain of salt, grain of salt. That's not me saying, okay, that's me saying, take it with a grain of salt. Um, additionally, and I think this is the most important part. When you feel good about yourself, when you feel good about your life, you want other people to feel good too. And so there's the phenomenon that people who feel good are a lot more likely to volunteer, they're more likely to cooperate, they're more likely to help their family and their friends. When you feel good, you want to make the world feel good. And so this is what is known as the feel good, do good phenomenon. We will finish up happiness with like the first five minutes of class. And the next time we're going to talk about something I'm sure you're all feeling right about now, stress stress, stress. I will see you on Wednesday. Don't forget to vote. If you haven't voted yet, election day is tomorrow. If you're old enough, go vote. And I will see you on Wednesday. Have a great day.